This is the Simpit Driving School. I'm your instructor, Sean Cole, and today we're here for the first installment of a new series called Attack the Track. Now, Attack the Track is designed specifically to help you learn how to be faster on a track. It is designed for beginner to medium level drivers, and each episode we will focus on a new track, looking at the map, and focusing on the important parts of the track and where to put our energy when we get there. This series is not designed to teach you how to set up the car. It is not designed to teach you how to drive a particular car at a particular track. After all, that's gonna change from sim to sim, from car to car. This is more about how to look at a track in a different way, how to break down and look at the important sections and really focus our energy in the right way, making sure that we're always on the right driving line, doing the right thing with the car. So for our first installment, we're actually gonna focus on Sebring. Sebring International Raceway dates back to 1950 and resides in Sebring, Florida, United States. It is one of the oldest constantly running tracks in America. The track was built upon an airfield and that is what explains its flat surface and long straights. Sebring in its full or international configuration is a 17 turn 3.7 mile or 5.95 kilometer road course that is known for being extremely bumpy and that makes handling the flat corners even more difficult. At first glance, the first thing that is obvious about Sebring are the extremely long and straight straightaways. And this is basically because it's built on the airfield. You can see the airfield right there in the track map. But this also means that you can figure out in advance without even turning a lap that turn 16 and turn 17 both lead onto these straightaways. And those corners are gonna be the most important when it comes to overall speed and the lowest lap times. So we're gonna focus a lot of our energy on those two turns without even getting in the car. Now let's go ahead and take a lap at Sebring at full speed. Things start off very fast at Sebring as we cross the line. Turn one is a fast left-hander. Approach it wide to the right and just a touch of the brake. The corner is very long and has plenty of runoff room as you exit. Turn two is a kink to the right followed by heavy braking for turn three a narrow left-hander with high curbing on each side. Turn four sets up turn five, which is a medium speed right-hand corner that opens up onto the gurney bend. At the end of this very long high speed section comes turn seven and the heavy braking for this hairpin of a corner. After the right-hander, there's a slight left to right coming off it before you immediately hit Fangio chicane, a full throttle right then left to keep the car unbalanced. To set up turn nine, you wanna get wide to the left and give it a good amount of braking to set up this 90 degree right-hander called Cunningham. Immediately following it is a pair of high-speed lefts called Collier. Turn 12 is a kink to the right that sets up the tower turn. Again, you will want your car as far left as possible to set up this second 90 degree turn to the right, the 13th corner on the track. Blazing down Flying Fortress straight, you enter Bishop Bend and then comes Gendabine. You want to start off to the left and make sure to slow down enough for this sharp right hander followed immediately by a left. And that corner actually sets up turn 16. A wide approach from the left will minimize the angle and then you are blasting your way down the Ullman straight and seeing just how fast your car can go. The final corner is turn 17 as you come in wide from the left and you are now setting up the final part of the corner and holding on through the bumps and we now turn ourselves back onto the front stretch for a very fast pass by pit lane and the fans. Now let's take one more lap at Sebring and break it down turn by turn, starting with turn one. You approach turn one at very high speed. Turn one is a long and medium to high speed corner while being very wide and bumpy. You don't have to break much for this corner and you will bleed off speed due to its long length. Meanwhile, late or over braking can interfere with turn in and the car's stability throughout the corner. However, there is a ton of runoff to work with if needed when the turn is taken too wide. It is best to sacrifice entry in the name of a good exit as it does lead on to a small straight. Turn two is a slight kink to the right that will not be a factor, but it does lead into turns three, four, and five, a left, right, left combination that leads onto a long time sensitive straightaway. 
Breaking into three is important and it has a narrow entry into the left turn with high curbing on both sides to be avoided. But the line from three to four is not critical with exception of setting up a good run out of turn five, one of the most important corners on the track. It is important that drivers set up turn five well and then also make sure to have enough patience before returning to the gas. Turn five has a late apex and seems to get tighter as the corner completes. The high curbing to the left will unsettle the car and the flat curbing in the runoff can be slippery if done aggressively. A good run out of turn five can set up a potential pass in the next braking zone. Turn six is the gurney bend and it will be taken at full speed as we head into the heavy braking zone of turn seven. Turn seven is the hairpin. It is a very narrow corner that is very tight. Drivers will enter this corner at near top speed and will be doing some very heavy braking. The tricky part of turn seven is the exit and visually there is a left right coming off this corner for those who came in too fast. However, when slowed down enough and the apex is made, you can straight line out of the corner and run over the curbs full on the throttle getting maximum speed into the next twisty section. For those who did overshoot the corner, they will also find it very slippery as they try to recover the car. Turns eight and nine are the Fangio chicane, a right-hander followed immediately by a left. This is a very fast chicane that in most cars will be taken at full speed and in general, you're gonna wanna avoid contact with the inside curbing here. We head into turn 10, Cunningham Corner at high speed. Turn 10 is a very tight right-hander that turns about 90 degrees. It is critical to get your car to the far outside left to set up the corner. It is an aggressive turn in and making sure not to run off wide that will help us set up the next critical section of the track. The left-hander that follows can be tricky in some cars. Coming off wide out of turn 10 will cause you to really fight your way around turn 11 Collier Curve. Even when done correctly, this double left-hander will try to push your car out wide as you are hard on the gas throughout it. Again, hitting the inside curbs will make this worse by unsettling the car. Completing this curve and getting the car all the way back to the left side of the track is all part of turn 12 and will be critical to making turn 13 up ahead. Turn 13, the tower turn, is another 90 degree right-hander. Because of the short angle of the corner, it can be taken at medium speed, but the driving line is absolutely critical. It starts with a very wide left entry, but whatever you do, don't touch the curbing or it will make the corner and braking even more difficult. You can be more aggressive than turn 10, but still avoiding the inside high curb. And then coming off the corner, you can utilize the runoff to the outside. Drivers who miss the driving line here will have problems staying on the track and off-road to the left is very slippery. Getting a good run out of turn 13 is also very important as it leads onto a wide open stretch of road called the Flying Fortress Straight. Turn 14 is another pair of shallow high speed left handers that go by the name Bishop Bend. In most cars these are taken at full speed and you can even use the inside curbing to shorten the driving line. This section is really not a problem unless you end up off the driving line and getting all the way back to the left side at the end is what is important to set up the next series of corners. Turns 15 and 16 are actually three corners in my opinion, so let's call them 15, 15B, and 16. The complex starts off with Gendabine Bend, a right-hander that starts things off. This corner can be taken at medium speed, but it is deceptively sharp. Many drivers find themselves overshooting this corner and going off to the left and over the curbing that will pop you up into the air and ruin everything. And the high curbing to the inside will unsettle the car as well. The left-hander that follows 15B is just a small kink and it sets up the most important corner on the track. Drivers must get their cars to the left and some will even go extremely wide to the left to make the angle of the corner even straighter. That corner is Le Mans Curve or Turn 16. It is a very quick right-hander that would be very easy if it weren't for the unsettling of the car through the previous turns. It also has about the only elevation change on the entire track. 
Most cars will require the slightest touch of the brake and in others, just getting off the gas will be enough to turn the car in and get a good line through this shallow corner. The inside curbing can be driven on, but can unsettle the car slightly. The same goes for the outside runoff curbing. When straight from getting the good line, it can be used to get back on the gas. But when still trying to make the corner, you're going to have to be easy on the gas because it can become slippery and you should be aware of that. A good run out of this corner will propel you down the longest, the Ullman Straight at a blistering speed. Turn 17 is a mystery for most people. On the map and on paper, it is one very long 180 degree corner that sends you back down the front stretch. In reality, turn 17 is taken in two different parts. The first section or entry will change from car to car. Some cars will have to do a slight touch of the brakes before even getting to the right hander. Higher downforce cars can go in bleeding off speed or at full throttle hanging on for dear life. And after that slight right hard entry, there's a little bit of a straightaway or breathing room before the real corner begins. Turn 17's second part has an enormously wide entry that I prefer to brake a bit early and a bit hard for. You will find different drivers taking different lines. Sometimes it's on purpose and sometimes it's just the car being pushed wide as it skips over the giant bumps of turn 17. A warning, these bumps can make braking very tricky and those who push it on the trail braking will find the car easy to spin if the front wheels grab too hard on any of the bumps. I find that slowing down well and spending more time coasting or at balanced throttle will get me through turn 17 well. I take a semi-wide entry and allow the car to bleed off speed through the first half of the corner. And then I take a late apex trying to maximize the length of the next straight. And that completes a lap of Sebring. If we look back and identify a few important parts of the lap, there are a few clear spots to focus on. Both turns 16 and 17 both lead onto the longest straights on the track. And both of these corners are tricky for entirely different reasons, but getting a good run out of both of these corners is critical to overall lap times. These corners also lead onto the long straightaways, which have the fastest speeds, and they are also potential drafting spots, and at the end, under braking, they're potential passing spots, so getting a good run will be important to defending your position as well. Now, there are other corners that we want to focus on as well. Turns 5, 7, and 13 all lead onto medium length or speed straights, and they will also be important to overall speed. So in the end, we have five corners out of the 17 that we learned are the most critical corners on the track when it comes to overall lap times. Now on the flip side, we can identify a handful of corners as well that I'm going to go ahead and call sacrifice corners. These are corners that instead of focusing on top speed, maybe focusing on the perfect driving line and being in the perfect position to set up the next corner is what's most important. Turns 4, 10, 15, and 15B are all these types of corners and should be treated that way to ensure best lap times. You could even say the whole first part of turn 17 is one of these as well. A mistake here can be very costly and a good run out of 17 can be very beneficial. So that leaves us only seven corners on the track that aren't that important and things that we really don't have to focus that much energy on. I really hope this show has helped you learn how to attack the track. I hope it's helped you learn how to look at the map and identify the corners, both from the map and the driving perspective, to pick the right driving line, to pick the right corners and know what to do, not just be a victim of the track and let it drive you around. So I hope this has helped you with Sebring. If you end up turning any laps at this track and you have a different approach, or if this has helped you out, please add that in the comments. Let us know. Let us know if you have a different line or a different way of getting through the corners. Maybe it'll help others out there as well. We'll follow other tracks in the future, maybe even other sims. It's not necessarily about what car we pick, but really how to, again, look at the map, dissect the important sections, and focus on the right corners that are going to lead to the fastest overall lap times. This is the Simpit Driving School. I'm your instructor, Sean Cole, and I'll see you on the track.